Tech Team Weekly. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tech Team Weekly. I'm joined, as always, by my fabulous co-host, Gwen Diagram. Gwen, hello. How are you? I'm I'm brilliant. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Running so, so late, as you can see. You're know, <laughs> totally un- unprepared. Yeah. Um, Neil, good morning, sir. How are you? I sound not bad. Yeah, I'm slightly thrown off by this different recording slots we've had before, but uh, looking forward and ready yeah. to go. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll make it work and we're going to make it real tight today. So coming up, uh, as always, we've got our stand-up updates. Uh, we've got social engineering, where we're going to tell you what's been going on uh, behind the scenes and with building in public. We've got this week's Epic, which is, which is all about payday loans. This is an interesting one. Uh, then we've got our news bites and our wash up. So let's hit it. The stand up. So, uh, like my entire like world has changed because there was an away day at work, um, which I didn't go to because I didn't want to be around 80 people. Um, uh, no, no, but that meant I had yesterday to work on whatever I wanted. Um, so it was just incredible. I did a draft of the engineering framework, which it's been killing me that I haven't had time to work on. Um, and yeah, it like, so I've got the draft, I'm going to get feedback. So happy. So, um, there's a really good talk from lead dev, which, um, really helped me. So we'll link that in the show notes. If you're looking to write an engineering progression framework and yeah. Um, so outside of work, it's my birthday this weekend, but keeping it hey. like, really down low. Um, and I'm going into the office on Monday for a big strategy session with the other seniors. Um, to just figure out like where we're going next. There's a lot around strategy, but yeah, I'm just feeling really positive after yesterday and getting a shitload of work done after I've only had like an hour a day for so long. So yeah, very happy. Awesome. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Life with me has been pretty much more of the same. Uh, so my postman update from last week was around releases we were doing, some secret, some not so secret. Uh, we pushed uh, a feature called Flows out to the world last week. I made a massive balls up by giving it the wrong name. I used the old internal name we'd used for it, uh, which actually drove a lo- load of uh, traffic to the podcast because uh, Beth Marshall was kind enough to, to put some videos on YouTube and write a blog post about the new feature. And all the people at the postman were going, why is she using the internal code name that we had for it? I was like, yeah, that was, that was me. Sorry. Uh, but uh, otherwise, there are more releases ongoing. We've, we've just put a code freeze in place that's going to mean that the next week is uh, a bit more stable than it has been. There's been a lot of firefighting this week. Uh, I've also just been announced to be on another upcoming postman live stream on October the 21st. This is the one that goes out on a Thursday evening in the UK and it's on Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, Periscope, other places. Um, it's a bit more free form, a bit more chatty. Uh, so looking forward to doing that. It's going to be called A Busy Developer's Guide to Testing. I'm going to be talking to a developer who is so busy with their life they haven't got time to write tests. I'm going to show them how easy it is to do in Postman. Um, I'm also putting together my slides for the upcoming test.bash conference. Um, they pre-record those sessions in advance because it's all screened online. So they want to make sure it's going to be smooth. So I uh, need to get my finger out and do that, which should be fine. And the day after this episode drops is a big day in the world of IT because Windows 11 officially launches. Um, How they're going to do that digitally, I don't know. I assume they're going to push it out as a Windows update at some point on Tuesday. Um, I'm in two minds because like Sand, and I stand off off, off air, you were saying you just bought a new PC. I bought a massive new gaming Mm -hmm. laptop that's touchscreen, bells and whistles, the most expensive item in my house. I'm not sure whether I want that to be exposed to Windows 11 at this stage, but also I want to get my hands on the new stuff. So it's it's Mm -hmm. so hard. I'm in two minds. Cool. And uh, in, in my update, uh, yeah, so I did buy a new PC, which is why um, I'm I'm just like, everything's like so rushed and in such a mess. Cause like literally, I think I was setting up yesterday or, or something like that. And yeah, I'm still plugging things in, um, but, but it's awesome. Cause um, I think my old PC is like nearly seven years old now. So, you know, it's definitely on its last legs and everything was so slow, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying the new PC. It's really cool. I've got like, you know, one of those fancy RTX 3080 graphics cards and I'm playing everything in ultra and life is awesome. Um, uh, so uh, I can announce my new job. I'm going back to uh, some of the old people that I used to work with at uh, Sky, but uh, on a slightly different team. Um, and uh, going forward, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to tell you about what I'm doing at work. Probably <laughs> very little because they're so secretive about what's going on, but uh, it'll be like probably a couple of weeks before I start uh, and uh, I'll keep you all updated. I played a little bit of bus sim this week, uh, which was good. I think I got over my a little buggy stage, um, but I've been playing this new MMO called New World, which has been really massive. Um, I think it launched like two or three days ago, and uh, it's got really good numbers and it's really good fun. 
Uh, I'm so excited about your new job, Sanj. That's amazing. Congratulations. Like, um, Thank you. the, the sky, uh, what's it? Campus in London. Will you be mm-hmm. going there? It's massive, isn't it? I yeah, wonder what huge, it looks yeah. like now. I mean, it's yeah. gorgeous and it's huge. I, I mean, I, my last job was at sky. I was there for like nearly a year before I, uh, took my little hiatus. So yeah, I'm just, just carrying on sort of where I That's left off. That's lovely. But yeah, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Yeah. It's really going to be a fun opportunity. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, what's the commute like? I've not done a commute in so long, but I forget what it even is. <laughs> I think uh, it's not too bad. It's less than an hour each way for me to drive, but I'll only be expected to go in maybe once or twice a week. So it's mostly remote. And uh, yeah, on the down low, I think most devs, most devs don't hardly go in ever at all. <laughs> don't, don't tell me one. The ones that I worked <laughs> with in London didn't really. Um, and yeah. it's fine. Like you don't need to, do you? No, so, no. Yeah. We can do our job. Yeah. Fantastic. Social engineering. So we had loads of feedback to last week's episode. Great to hear from you all, as always. Uh, Chris Chant uh, on Twitter said he loved Gwen's Diablo 2 story. Uh, we can always promise to bring you more stories. <laughs> um, thanks also to Lee Hawkins for sharing the love about the podcast. He was delighted to hear that Gwen referred to him as Rad. Uh, I've uh, interviewed Lee on a podcast before on Tessa <laughs> Discs, and he is indeed a Rad gent, massive fan of status quo, uh, and uh, a very, very passionate all round in, in work and uh, play. Um, on last week's episode topic, where we were talking about salary disclosure the pros and cons uh, melissa fisher said that she was stuck on 20k for years as a junior and wishes she'd had the uh, the, the foresight to challenge it more um, and maybe if people were sharing their salaries it would have been easy for her to, to do that uh, ben doe said that when he was at citrix they were very protective about pay and discussions about salaries internally he saw graduates being taken on for higher salaries than he was on they eventually adjusted his salary to compensate but they made it seem like they were doing him a favor Um, Nowadays, he says when he joins companies, he hopes that people who are already there are earning more than him because they deserve to be, frankly, and that gives him something to aim for. Lee Marshall, in talking Mm -hmm. about his previous workplaces, he says Mm -hmm. he doesn't think they would have been happy if he'd publicly shared his salary and his increments. (laughs) And he says it's as if they won't worry that if people discover there are pay disparities, they might not be happy, (laughs) which is, I think, very true. Uh, Interesting feedback from the world of recruitment. Gabby Trotter says that it's an interesting topic. She speaks to so many people as a recruiter who are grossly underpaid and they often have no idea of that and more transparency must be the way forward. She also points out that recruiters typically get a percentage of an employee's starting salary as their commission. So it's in a recruiter's best interests to make sure that that candidate is paid fairly, which is interesting. I hadn't really considered it from the uh, recruitment point of view. And finally, we had some feedback from Jamie Tanner, the author of the original article that we were discussing last week, who shared his salaries publicly. He thanked us for covering the topic. He said there was a really good discussion and he does hope that more folks will share their salaries to help more juniors and underrepresented groups get what they're worth. I'm intending to do something, as I said last week, I don't think I've got rich enough data of what's happened to me after I joined companies. Like I've got all my original contracts. Um, I'd have to try and fathom out a bit. Um, I'll see what the email trails are like, but uh Gwen, what else is happening in the world of our socials? What's going on with uh, the stats? So uh, a massive shout out to Claire Reckless, who is our newest Patreon subscriber. So thank you, Claire. We really Yay. appreciate it. Thank and you, Claire. And a shout out to her dog as well, which is how she listens while she's walking her dog. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and, yeah, lots of plays on Anchor this week, I believe, because of uh, Beth's article and your friends at Postman. So, it's up 50% from 130 to 195, so that's really good. Views are up 24% on YouTube from last week. Uh, LinkedIn, we've now got 171 uh, followers. Is it followers on LinkedIn? Mm-hmm. And Twitter, mm-hmm. 177 followers. So, uh, yeah, thanks for all the interaction. Really appreciate it. Yeah, just very briefly, LinkedIn took the lead. And then I went on a follower spree, a following spree on Twitter. I followed a few targeted accounts who, who were nice enough to give us follow backs. So, uh I push Twitter into the lead. Nice. <laughs> I love how you two are working the social media stuff, you know. Yeah, it looks like we're getting closer and closer to actually putting some Patreon content out there. We said when we get 10 patrons, we'll do something. We're at five now, so halfway. Pressure's on. Yeah. I think you said when we get to 10, you'd do something. So I can't <laughs> wait to see what that is. <laughs> okay. It's not like I haven't got enough solo projects already. Why not? One more. <laughs> 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 the 
This week's epic. This week's main story is the growing number of banks and storefronts which are focusing on so-called buy now, pay later services. Much like store cards, these allow customers to take a single transaction and spread the cost across multiple months, often with the lure of interest free repayments, although they are repayments nonetheless, you still have to keep up with them. When we first decided to cover this topic, we were going to primarily reference Revolut and Monzo, the latter having recently begun trialling its Monzo Flex repayment scheme. But this was blown out of the water this week when MasterCard, with something like 750 million customers worldwide, announced they will be launching their own buy now, pay later service in key markets for both online and in-store car purchases. Card purchases, not car purchases. You could buy a car on a credit card. I did that once. That's a story I should tell them at the time. Uh, these companies are joining a wealth of others who've launched their own buy now, pay later services in recent months, including PayPal, Amazon and Apple, all of whom, all of whom have some variant on that service. The UK government says that it plans to introduce stricter regulations in the sector, including mandatory affordability checks. But as things stand, it's kind of the dangerous wild west of the lending market. According to figures from CNBC, five million Brits have taken advantage of buy now, pay later services during the pandemic, with one in 10 of those customers already in payment arrears. It seems like deja vu all over again. It seems like only so long as it's the Wonga bubble. It concerns me who they're marketing these kind of services at as well, because usually it's like buy some new clothes, buy some makeup, like it's lots of younger people. Um, which makes me really sad because we were all young and shit broke at one point and, mm. you know, it would feel a bit appealing because, yeah, but it's just quite sad. Have you, how do you both feel about working on something like this? I know it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I think the issue here is that the, the regulations are so loose and actually I think it's important to note, note that Monzo is one of the banks who's going to be actually introducing some degree of affordability checks. They're not just going to give the money to everybody. Um, I don't think those affordability checks are going to be the same as a hard credit check on your, on your account or whatever, but um, there are plenty of people out there who um, aren't, you know, regulated in the UK, who serve customers in the UK who can technically do what they want because the market is, is open. And it's one of those situations you can see with the amount of escalation going on right now, that because people can, they are. And I think the regulation is going to be slow to catch up. I think for me, there is, there is some overlap um, in terms of, of, of working on this sort of feature. It gives me jitters in the same way as I'm not sure I could work for um, like a gambling company where you are incentivized to improve the business by hooking people on what you're doing and what you're doing is addictive and for to some people shopping and spending money is addictive and um again although this isn't technically a line of credit they're using phrases like you know make things easier to pay well they're easier to pay in the moment but these are payments that are going to go on and on and they're going to make future payments on other things harder to do because you've got to keep up your repayments uh, and for, for me the scarcity of re regulation right now is what's scariest for me I, I don't know. I, I don't think I would feel very good about working on, on stuff like this, but I guess, you know, you, you know, that going in, like I, pr I probably wouldn't apply to at a company like this. Right. And anecdotally, I can tell you a story. So I went to bootcamp in 2015 to retrain into dev. Right. And Wonga were actually one of the hiring partners at the end of that journey. Um, and if I remember correctly, they were really nice people. Like the devs, the three of like, you know, their lead sort of dev team came down. They were really nice and supportive and stuff, but I think they got almost no applications or maybe, maybe like one or two and everyone else got like 10 or 20, you know, I think the, the feel instantly was amongst my peers was very much like, no, we can't, we don't want to work on this, you know? So it's quite difficult as well, because some of the like less appealing companies like gambling companies some of them have really nice tech stacks mm -hmm. um which makes it difficult isn't it so um mm -hmm. some of the like leeds has a lot of gambling companies and they were ahead of the curve with their tech stacks before everyone else and so it was tempting to go and work there with um the beautiful tech stacks like you know they were using kafka and uh, and Kubernetes and stuff like that. And it's like the experience I'll get going there, but um, mm. I I couldn't do it. I, I did apply and like, I couldn't do it. It was just like, yeah, it's too hard. Um, but I mean, it's up to it's up to people whether they want to work on things like that, isn't it? I think there is some sensitivity in the industry to this sort of thing. I remember uh, at one of the recent um, sort of mid pandemic test bashes, um, they're asking people if they're interested in hosting social events. And I said, 
I'd love to host, you know, a poker night, not for not for money, you know, just on one of these like free let's let's have a game of poker kind of sites. And one of the the event organisers uh, rightly pointed out that there actually there are people in our community who have had issues with gambling and addiction in the past, and it wouldn't be sending out the right message. And although it's a shame, not running that was the right thing to do. I have mm. a terrible story about something like that. Um, so. I went to a peer conference and the entertainment for the night was um, going to a casino and um, I got a little bit drunk um, as I used to do. And uh, there were free games where they showed you how it worked. Um, and I remember I, like, I just chucked all my coins or whatever it was on something. And uh, the person who was running the like game said, if this was real money, you would have won a lot of money. And I flipped my wig. I was just like, how dare you say that? That's disgusting. And like, because I was a little bit drunk as well. And like, yeah, mm -hmm. it was just really embarrassing. Like, it's it's quite <laughs> triggering, isn't it? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the principle behind this is they want to make it easy for you to borrow money and in the hopes that enough people fall behind on their payments so they can start, you know, collecting debt and, you know, get fees and stuff. And I mean, I thought it was maybe in the one or 2% range. I had no idea what you're telling me. Uh, the one in 10 of these customers are already in arrears. That's ridiculous. I, I'm sure it's at least That's in part due to, due to the I pandemic. I didn't realize that. I'm sure it's at least in part due to the pandemic and, and people being furloughed and the fact that I think there have been like, most of the banks have put offers on the table saying, you know, if you need to take payment breaks or, or, or worse than that, um, that obviously you, you can discuss with them, but, um, mm. it's, yeah, it, it's so difficult. It, it's, it's almost like that kind of like the first hit is free kind of thing. A lot of these, I know Monzo's offering is you could spread it over three months and it's interest free, or you could spread it over longer, you know, if it's a bigger payment or, you know, you want to pay it back a smaller chunks, but we'll charge you interest on those. So they're like, they make you realize how simple it is to do this. It's just a button press in the app. And then before you know it, you're buying a new MacBook and spreading mm -hmm. over 12 months and, and not, not thinking about what the next 12 months are going to look like. Do you two think that uh, we've learned from the whole payday loan sort of bubble? You know, we, it took maybe six or 12 months and the government stepped in and sort of sorted it out. All those companies kind of went out of business. The business model wasn't viable anymore. Do you think we've, we've learned? Is this, is this just that again? This is the next big thing, but lay by. So lay by was around when I was a kid. I don't know if it was a big thing over here, mm. um, but you'd go to like Kmart um, and you could buy stuff for Christmas and spread it over many, many weeks. Um, but I don't know if that felt different because it was uh, like in store or something and you had to go and physically pay because it was the nineties or what, but mm. I think making it so easily accessible for absolutely anything like is mm. the problem um and the companies that are using these kind of services like you see it on clothes you see it on makeup uh like yeah and as well they're advertising via youtube so loads of the youtubers i watch are um are sponsored by Klarna. Klarna is it yeah um mm, yeah and yeah and you know they're targeting young women who are like very uh, influenced by this kind of consumer nature. Um, and yeah, that quite, that upsets me quite a lot. There's, there's a part of me that feels like it's, it's still slightly better than the credit card where if you, if you, if you know, if all you do is making your minimum credit card repayments, then then that, and that is not going to go down. Uh, at least if it's a fixed number of payments, you have that route to, to completion. Um, I, st I still feel like it's something that perhaps employers should be doing more to talk about because, um, things like financial, um, uh, so fiscal responsibility isn't something that's it certainly wasn't in my day wasn't taught, wasn't taught in the school so much i know that um martin lewis of money saving expert has put together like a package of you know like like the sort of tips he normally sends to households but targeted at children for to help them understand you know the, the value of money and 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 why and when you should save and you know, that sort of thing but we don't teach it so much in schools and by the time we get to to, to the workplace we're doing a bad enough job of, of teaching people how to how to use things like pensions effectively um there was a really co good comment on twitter actually from from mm. lee marshall who said that um yeah he, he says that money isn't taught enough uh, it's seen as a bit of a taboo uh, employers should be encouraging better understanding of their pension schemes the benefits of stock options uh, and he points out that if your employees are insecure financially and it leads to you know stress and mental health problems it could hurt you as a company so it's in your best interest 
I think I think as a society we're getting better at teaching kids about money as well, right? Yeah, I think the kids. Um, I use the kids as makes me sound really old. I, I think they have their own traps that they're trying to avoid right now, particularly in, in gaming, where they're introducing these um, these loot boxes and stuff into games, where you know you you buy fake currency with real currency, and then you use that to gamble in game, and maybe you unlock a new player in FIFA or a new skin in some game, um, and and that stuff is, is highly unregulated. And the worst thing in that mm-hmm. situation is. It's the parents who don't necessarily understand. You know, they've signed up to Xbox Live or whatever with the, with the parents' credit card, and that, that's been agreed. But now there's a, a a form of credit on file, and and the kid could just go into a game and press a button, and you know they spent fifty quid, a thousand quid in some cases on on real um, real money on things in games. Mm. That's going to be boxes. That would be an interesting epic one week, right? I agree. So, oh my god, I hate those things. Yeah. There's, there's, <laughs> Again, there's, there's regulation on the way in that area. I think my favorite thing was, was it someone from EA, I think, went in front of like a parliamentary committee and, and used the phrase to describe them and said that they, were, they, they weren't, you know, they're not gambling. They are surprise mechanics. Like, oh, you get a lovely surprise. You know, you paid money for it and it might yeah. be what you want, but they're just sort of trying to rebrand it. So I'm, I'm very keen to see what kind of government kind of uh, regulation comes in around this because I think that, it's growing and more needs to be done and mm. we need to like we need to look at who it's targeted at so um i bought i bought a bed on like a 3 month payment thing uh years ago um and i really needed a bed um <laughs> so like i don't know it can come in handy like especially like i think the bed was 400 pounds and i couldn't buy a 400 pound bed at the time you know and it was so nice actually being able to get a bed spread over time, but that went on my credit file, um, which, which is fine. Um, these things that don't go on your credit file, it kind of feels a bit more like free money instead of like, okay, I'm getting this loan to buy a bed. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether they should go on credit files or not. I I don't know. Is it a good thing? Probably Mm -hmm. like, I don't know because then how do other lenders know that you've got all these like little pieces put together? Yeah. 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 The whole thing around credit is like really bizarre because it's like one day you might need a good credit history, but if you've never borrowed money, you have no credit history, right? So it's like it's like this self-fulfilling ecosystem. Like you've got to take part in it and be really well behaved to then be able to continue taking part in it. Cause like you, you know, you, if you never borrowed anything, you'll never even get a mortgage, will you? Mm-mm. Yeah. Uh, I worked at Call Credit, which is now TransUnion. And before that I had no idea about credit scores and mm. working there was so, so good. Like I feel really privileged that I've worked at Call Credit and Monzo because the difference that those have made to my financial health have been massive because you're somewhere where mm. people We'll talk about money and how to improve these kind of things. And without those, I think I'd still be like having a lot of money troubles, you know, well, maybe not because I'm earning a lot more and there's a lot more freedom there, but yeah. Um, yeah. I feel very privileged. I always thought historically that your credit score was something you only looked at if you were like right on that red line of, you know, you worried whether you could take out, you know, another store card or something, but just looking at that information day to day, month by month, using services like Experian and all the people who ingest their data is really, really valuable. Like I had a credit card that had a zero balance on and I was umming and ahhing over whether to close that card off or not. And then I got the understanding that part of your affordability is based on like the percentage of your credit that you're using. So the fact that I had some money on one card, but then another empty card meant that my total percentage of credit was a lot yet lower than it would have been if I closed that other card. Um, so there was actual financial benefit to having a little bit of plastic that I was never going to use. <laughs> and then ironically, I think it was Virgin Money. Like they, they were like, you wow. should not, you should use your card for a year. We're going to close that account down. I was like, no, that matters. <laughs> <laughs> my free credit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm my pot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I think bottom line, we think uh, this is not a great idea. If you're not certain, you can pay it back and uh, we need a little bit uh, of uh, regulation. Uh, the government maybe step in and make sure people aren't getting out of their depth again, right? Like we did yeah. uh, and maybe about five or 10 years ago. And certainly, you know, if you have experiencing financial troubles or you're, you're thinking of opening any line of credit for any reason, um, do reach out and talk to either a financial advisor or the Citizens Advice Bureau or, you know, just the community, just talk. Again, the more we have open discussions about these things, um, the more we can normalize the discussion. 
if you're in trouble as well, Step Change are amazing. I also worked at Step Change a long time ago and they help people so, so much um, by, yeah, it's a charity and free to use and they can help you set up like plans and budgets on how to get out of debt. Absolutely amazing charity. Awesome. Great shout. News Bites. There is a mobile phone you probably have not heard of. It's called Anom. The device had been modified to remove many of its core functions. Anom could not be bought in a shop or on a website. You had to first know someone in the know, then you had to be prepared to pay the astronomical cost of US $1,700 for the handset and $1,250 annual subscription. An astonishing price for a phone that was unable to make phone calls or browse the internet. Almost 10,000 users around the world have agreed to pay, not for the phone, uh, as much as a specific application installed on it. Opening the phone's calculator allowed users to enter a secret code to launch a social messaging application. The people selling the phone claimed that Anom was the most secure messaging service in the world. This was mostly used by violent criminal drug gangs. Uh, it was used to move tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, drugs around the world and uh, conduct lots of nefarious activities. Here's where the story gets interesting. Uh, the nearly 20 million messages sent on the app since its launch in 2018 had been collected by the Australian Federal Police, who together with the FBI had conceived, built and marketed and sold the devices. This is a, this is like a fascinating, like cops and robbers story. Like, you know, um, this is really good fun to read. Um, it was called Operation Ironside in Australia and Oper Operation uh, Trojan Shield in the rest of the world. Um, it, it was covered on The Guardian. It's a fascinating read. Um, it's quite long, but uh, it, it's really enthralling. We'll put the link in there. What, what, what do so, you two think about this? Would you, would you, would you buy an Anom? Not now. <laughs> yeah, you, I guess you can't, can't get it now. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. I don't, I don't know the laws around entrapment, but I assume it's not entrapment if you sell them the, 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 the platform. Mm. They're discussing things on themselves. Mm, yeah. <laughs> It's like a uh, it's like a comic book or something. This whole story. So uh, Persona Five, the PlayStation game, has that where there's like an app that appears on your device and you go in. It just sounds so comic book to me. Yeah. It's really hilarious. Um, but yeah, it's, quite it's, a clever well, little sting. Yeah. yeah, really clever. I mean, it's one of those things which was so crazy that it worked. Totally. Imagine if that was your idea. You'd be so smug. <laughs> I wonder why they chose to give it up and rather keep it under wraps. I mean, I guess they, they had enough. They caught enough people. I mean, this and there was like literally worldwide stings happening over the course of like 48 hours uh, coming out of this. Okay. Cats out Could you bag. imagine sitting on that as well? You'd have to break <laughs> eventually. You'd be like, come on, we have to just break this. Yeah. This is too funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if like, just to name someone at random, what if like Vodafone turned around to her and said, surprise, secret police sting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's> terrifying. <laughs> That'd be yeah. hilarious. Yeah. All right, let's... Cool. All right. So uh, I've just got a little bit of a cute one this week. Uh, so for April Fools, Stack Overflow announced a copy paste mechanical keyboard, and due to great demand, they have made it a real thing. So it's a little three key configurable macro pad with, uh, I think it's Calais black box switches. I'm a bit out of mechanical keyboards at the moment. Uh, I got my like perfect keyboard, so not up on my switches, but it's got custom stack overflow branded keycaps as well. It's on pre-order. You can buy it from Drop, which if you're into mechanical keyboards, like you will know Drop. And there's really simple instructions on how to reconfigure it as well, um, if you're that way inclined. So if you purchase the key, as it's called, Stack Overflow's profits go to Digital Undivided, which is an accelerator program for high potential Black and Latinx women-led startups. And I've got to say, like, the whole thing is just really rad. It's a really cute little thing. Um, mechanical keyboards, like, everyone loves a good mechanical keyboard. And, yeah, uh, an accelerator program for high potential Black and Latinx women-led startups is, like, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's awesome. I thought of it initially as just a fun novelty, but the uh, the the angle, the fundraising angle is uh, is, is very good. I, I will look harder at that. Um, I'm going to complete this uh, trilogy of, of hardware related mm. stories today um, with new, exciting news from Amazon's fall hardware event. Uh, not only did they confirm that their flying indoor home security drone named the Always Home Cam 
it's a real product that you can actually order. I don't know if you saw the videos like six months ago. It literally, it's just a drone that flies around your house and it can, you know, it's got a camera on it. It's crazy stuff. Um, but they also unveiled Astro, which is best described as a cross between a Roomba and K9 from Doctor Who. Uh, the wheeled device, which I've nicknamed the electronic good boy, uh, combines much of Amazon's existing tech stack by including an onboard ring camera, which you can use when it's patrolling the house. And its face is a touchscreen Amazon Echo device, which displays a pair of blinking eyes while it's scooting wow. around. It's currently only available to pre-order in the United States with prices starting at $999. Or buy now, pay later, I suppose. <laughs> but perhaps more intriguing are the words <laughs> leaked by one of the developers on the project who say that the person detection is unreliable at best and it will almost certainly throw itself down a flight of stairs. <laughs> Going on to state that the Astro is absurdist <laughs> nonsense, potentially dangerous for anyone who'd rely upon it for accessibility purposes. Another of the project's development team anonymously, anonymously added that the RoboDog is a privacy nightmare that is an indictment of our society and how we trade privacy for convenience. Now, we sometimes get these insider stories coming out <laughs> after the fact. It's very weird that they come out before the product even launched. You know, it, it's funny. Before you said all that bad stuff about it at the end, I was thinking, hey, this is a cool thing. I might get one. <laughs> do you both have uh smart home devices in your home I, yeah i have I, an, an alexa um i quite like it i have a, a bunch of um i'll just call them amazon themed ones um many because they're in earshot and i don't want to start saying their name and setting them all off uh but yeah we've oh, yeah. a bunch of those a bunch of those which are perhaps not as smart as i would like sometimes uh we, we certainly have the ring uh doorbell and security camera at the back of our garden as well um for, for security reasons which is really good uh we also we also do have a uh a digital, digital what's the word look for it's, it's not a Roomba but it's a it's a vacuum cleaner that's cheaper than a Roomba uh and uh that's basically been sitting gathering dust since we moved which is ironic because we could use it to clean up the dust <laughs> <laughs> so that's very ironic yeah I've got the Amazon ones and it's really funny because I mostly use them to listen to a radio station that's in the US but uh one of the podcasts on there Tektronic um they absolutely hate the Amazon devices and like any of these smart home devices. And it just feels mm -hmm. so ironic. I'm always like, please play <laughs> WFMU like 99. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> so I would like to get rid of them, but I also appreciate being able to listen to this radio station because otherwise like it's online for me. Um, yeah. Can, can, can I tell you both about the cool, one of the coolest things I've ever owned? Um, I, I sold it years ago now, but it was a collector's item. It was like a little miniature R2-D2, but it was like a 60% sort of scale. So it was quite large, actually. It was like, you know, one and a half, two feet tall. And it was like a robotic, it was really expensive. It was like a couple of hundred quid or something, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, it was like a robotic R2-D2 that went around and did stuff and uh, collected dust. And then it went up in value and I sold it. Yeah. I wish I had kept it now, actually. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. I think like it can't, these things can't be that popular in the UK because most of us have stairs. Um, mm. The UK is a very stair heavy country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there was a really funny video someone put on Twitter of a Roomba last week, perhaps, um, where they put it on a, a checkered patterned carpet, uh, like a rug. And the Roomba um, thought that, that was like a cliff. So it was just going around this one little square of the carpet, doing this one little square, oh, but scared no. to go outside it. Like, uh, yeah, shout out to whoever designed the detection algorithms. <laughs> oh, no. Poor, Listen, poor little robot. You feel really sorry for them, don't you? You really mm, give them mm. personalities and names and stuff like that. Mm. It's interesting how humans are so inclined to do that. Mm. You, you know what? I might end up getting this uh, ridiculously uh, poorly made privacy nightmare dog. Uh, I'll keep you. I'll keep you two posted. <laughs> Please <Yeah>. do. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye. Bye. Bye all. Thank you. Good day. See you soon. <laughs> Love you. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Neil. <laughs> that got that on deep <laughs> Tech Team Weekly.